All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so welcome everyone to the March 11th iteration of the SIG storage meeting. Uh, as a reminder, please add your agenda items to the doc. Um, and we will get started. Actually, we'll do the triage at the end. So uh, Dinesh, if you're ready with the live migration topic, let's uh, get right into it if, if you're good with that. Absolutely, that's fine. Sorry, I just took a bite of my sandwich, assuming I'd have a bit more time. So, apologies. <laughs> um, so a little bit of background. Um, I'm Dinesh. I am CTO of Sivo. Um, we use Kubevert to power our public cloud. So very, very similar to OpenShift um, is what mm -hmm. we do, but offer it out to, to customers. Um, we've had some requests to start supporting live migration in our platform. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that there is a hard requirement for read write many volumes. Um, and at the moment, the storage class we use, which is powered by MyStore, does not do um, read write many. And just mm -hmm. wondering what options we may, there may be no options that we have, but considering things like, um, you know, VMware work with iSCSI mount points that are not traditionally read write many, of what the limitations <clears throat> are around read write many and is it a kubernetes or is it a kubevert limitation yeah so um good question i can try to start taking this and then <clears throat> anyone else on here feel free to to jump in but um we don't we we can definitely how's how best to put this <clears throat> the read write many is the best way to express the concept in kubernetes that a piece of storage um, needs to be allowed to be attached to two nodes at one time. Um, but the way that live migration with QMU actually works is we're never actually writing to the device from two separate nodes. It's always orchestrated uh, the QMU process. So it's a handover. I'm not sure to what extent you're familiar with the, uh, the way that QMU does live migration, but essentially the new process is started on the new node. Um, it needs to be able to have access to the storage uh, at the same time as the original process. And then uh, we use a TCP connection to synchronize VM state from the source node to the destination node. And then there's a smooth handover to the, uh, the destination. So there is only one writer at any given time. However, in order to instruct Kubernetes to make that volume available on two separate nodes at the same time, that has to be read write many. So uh, we certainly are using iSCSI devices um, with a read write many access mode um, to power that. In Ceph, we do the same thing. Um, and it's understood that, you know, with a Ceph RBD block device, if you had two uncoordinated processes writing to the device, you'd have problems as well. So um, it's kind of a a little bit heavy handed of a requirement, I guess you could argue, because it's not true read write many support that we need. It is just multi node attach. And I'm guessing that the only way for Kubelet Kubernetes to understand that a single volume can be multi node attached is read write many correct yeah okay so i mean I th yeah so if you had uh a if the provisioner or your uh, i didn't quite catch the storage provider that you have but if they're able to so like for <clears throat> for ceph for example you know we worked with them and we said well we understand the uh, the dragons flying around this particular topic, um, but our process is intelligent, and so we can handle the multi-attach without the usual caveats. We we understand it. So uh, potentially the same thing could be done with um, with so your the, storage provider. Yeah, so it's my store, the Open EBS project that we're using. Okay. Um, so now I, I've got a good relationship with them. So it's just basically saying. Give me a read write many raw block device and and yes, I won't raise a support ticket when it all goes wrong. Yeah. Yeah, essentially that's <laughs> it. So if it's capable to, to be attached, yeah, exactly. So it's it typically tends to be an easier problem. It might be nice if there was a way to express this uh 
this uh, nuanced access mode for a PVC, but um, really it's very specific to, you know, how QMU is working. So I wouldn't expect the platform to really entertain us on that. Has it been broached for a different type of storage class upstream Kubernetes of a like read write once many mount kind of storage yeah, not paradigm? To, not as far as I'm aware. And would that have to go via SIG storage? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it would be a fair uh, it'd be a fair thing to raise uh, there. I would expect there to be, you know, because uh, we we pushed issues in uh sig storage in the past and it's usually pretty important to find a non vert use case as well uh to explain why it could be useful to more than <clears throat> just what we're trying to do okay um thanks alex for the for the link i will have a i'll have a look at that as well but that, those are those are my questions great okay uh so yeah thanks for raising it and I suppose if there's yeah any follow up we can come back here. Uh, Cubevert Dev, feel free. Um, yeah, see how we can I know. A, I know a good few group of the Sig storage Kubernetes Sig storage group, so I'll probably have some off off the record conversations with them at KubeCon in a couple of weeks and get their get their feel. And I'm happy to report back here if it's of interest or if anything. Of yeah, note please do. It's worth mentioning. Please do. Yep. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. So we have, that was our last or our only non-triage uh, agenda item. Did anyone else have any other items before we go into issue triage? All right. So let's do that. I'll pop this open. Okay, CDI fails to clone a file system. Error code 500. Wow, lots of info provided. This is good. Has anyone taken a look at this yet? Oh, Alex. Okay. And that was last week. So maybe give them a little bit of a chance to uh, check the logs. Anything else we want to say on this one? No, once we have the verbosity increased, we would get the exact Taantar error. Okay. I wonder if that's uh, potentially we should try to uh, put that Antar error in the default verbosity. That seems important. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't see why not. It's under verbosity three. It could easily be just default one. Available space less. Yeah, I'm trying to see where it. Oh, that's the import. Yeah. Yeah, definitely should have some additional output there. <clears throat> So let me write that down. All right. I don't know if anyone wants to sign up for that one. All right. Oh, we have Alvaro unable to talk. Um, let's see if I can unmute you somehow. Probably doesn't. No, um, oh, there we I'm, go. Yeah, I'm able to talk, but Shelly is now the one who is not. 
Oh, now she's the unlucky one. Oh, that is odd. You've passed the uh, the baton of unluckiness to Shelley. Mm. I'm not sure. Maybe try to rejoin. I don't know. That's about the only thing I could suggest. All right. Um, okay. So I think with this one, we are good. Let's go back up to the issues and see if there's any next. 3119. Okay. Attempting to clone data volume. Attempting to configure block storage. Anyone take a look at this one yet? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I looked at it and I can't remember exactly. Yeah, so uh, they were using the PVC API, but then they tried to fill in the storage profile with the correct uh, set of volume access modes. Okay. And they didn't realize they're opting out by using the PVC. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should okay. take a look at, at the example uh, that lists PVC um, under the data volume. I wonder where they take it from. Yeah, I think there's definitely, we should, since we're mainly all of us focused on the storage API, we should probably be looking to deprecate the PVC API at some point. Uh, we also don't really have a lot of good um, examples in the Kubevert user guide, which is, I think, where most people are looking at. This has been something I've mentioned in the past. I think we even have a JIRA issue for it um, as well. So um, could be a good opportunity. Let's see. So I would find that. Registry source is using the PVC. This is using the PVC. Yeah, so all of these examples in this this file appear to be, um, except for maybe the explicit <clears throat> storage. Yeah, these are all PVC. And then finally a storage example. But then back to PVC. <laughs> okay. So I think this is a good, this is 311, 3122. Yeah, it's on one hand, we do want to deprecate the PVC API, but on the other hand, if some provisioners will, will have alignment bugs like top LVM has or something like this then <clears throat> pbc api may be very handy because otherwise uh, it, it will at least let people uh, provision like uh, uh, um, provision uh, pvcs with the uh, storage that they requested explicitly with no changes storage api yeah, <clears throat> yeah that's a good point um Okay, so I've captured that at least. I'll probably be looking for some help to get those uh, taken. 
Okay, I'm gonna close this tab. And then let's check this one, CDI deployment. This is one labels value. Okay. Uh, he wants it assigned to him, so let's do that. I think it makes sense to me, right? So we're just missing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Just uh, let me leave a, leave a note myself that he doesn't accidentally change the selector on the deployment because I believe that that label key is the selector. Okay, so let's I'll, I'll let you do that as well. Yeah. Awesome, all right. So I think that brings us to the top of the list. Were there any other issues we should visit? So there are a couple of feature requests here in the issues that maybe we should reconsider or at least uh, read again here. <clears throat> if you okay. scroll down, uh, I think it's on the bottom. Uh, this one, uh, feature gate uh, flag for allowing CDI workloads to run as root. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know uh, what we decided there, if maybe we should reconsider this or close the issue. Yeah, I, I remember there being pretty robust discussion around this one. Um, Alexander is not here today. I don't recall where we left the conversation at the end. Okay, I see that's uh, seems that Michael makes a pretty good point on that. I guess it would just take somebody that wants to uh, sponsor that. Uh, yeah, those were some uh, folks from Google, uh, hopefully. Uh, they would chime in. They actually had a storage provider that um, couldn't be configured to um, to respect FS group, I think. Mm. Which is, you know, like arguably, this is uh, not something very common. Like if you bring uh, your storage solution to Kubernetes, like the uh, FS group is uh, a must. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, generally, I would hope that they help with this. Yeah. Uh, I think El Zhang is the Google person, and mm -hmm. may have been one more. OK. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that like I would have objection to it. I also don't. It's one of those issues about patches welcome, I would say, um, in this case, because like it's not something that that important to me personally that I would spend my time on it. But if someone else wants to, um, maybe we don't have a strong reason to block it. I would say that's kind of how I feel about it. Um, I don't know if we need to say anything on that, but it's yeah, it's kind of one of these things where. We should uh, promote the fact that it's an open source project. Um, any other thoughts or comments? I don't know. If, I don't really know that we need to update with that, but I would suggest that 
we just sort of leave the door open to this, which is what we kind of did. Okay, I don't hear any comments. Um, which other ones should we review? So we have several like this. For example, in the second page, uh, we have one one about uh, ARM ARM64 support. Mm -hmm. And I know Alexander already has a PR, but in the comment, uh, he mentioned that maybe we should close it. So yeah, I'm not too sure what how we should move forward with this one. Okay, we up we said we'd update the release script. Doesn't this PR link to um like uh, Alexander's PR in, in the infra repository? Okay, here we go. I guess that has more details on what's happening. It's still open. Yeah, and maybe the comments would uh, hint on why. Okay, here we go. He says uh, he will likely close this in favor of a script in CDI. I guess something goes wrong here. Okay, so then we should probably come back to this issue and I'll just ask. Okay. All right, which ne which one next? So most of these are just waiting for something to happen. So um I'm not too sure. Maybe the one about adding ability to set a CDI upload server, uh like the cer certificate renewal period. I'm also not too sure if maybe we should move forward or not. Okay, three weeks ago it was uh, touched. Okay. <clears throat> So it seems like uh, based on Michael's comment, it would need some sort of reorchestration of things. Maybe not like a good community member PR. <clears throat> or yeah, I mean, I mean it's not, like uh, uh, you know, yeah, we just have to um, monitor the certs and make sure to restart things. Um, but restarting upload pods is, could, could be kind of tricky because like, what if an upload is in progress? Yep. We can't, it's a tough thing to report, you know, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, and if there's an active connection, everything is working fine and you wouldn't want to restart. Right. Mm-hmm. What's the motivation, do they say originally, other than just? Yeah, I think, right. So we have these, because we haven't um, added in this restart uh, support for upload pods, um, we have to have, we basically, have to support them running for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So their certs expire in like 10 years. Okay. Or the CA expires in 10 years or something like that. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, the, re the real, I think, um, investigation is, is how we could support, um, yeah, rotating these certs. Um, and the big challenge, again, the thing that's underlining all, underlying all of this, like the typical in Kubernetes, you just, um, you know, you update a secret and your certs are updated automatically, no big deal. But because our upload pods run in uh, any um, namespace, we don't want to give our controller permission to read secrets in every namespace. Yeah. And um, so that gets us in this clunky um, mode where we have to like, we can really only create, delete things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not clear to me what the next step should be. I mean, I think if you wanted to reach out to this person, Michael, and see if they were interested in like helping to work on it, which would potentially turn them into a contributor with some a uh, little bit of oversight from you potentially if you have an idea about how the how it should look like. Um, it'd be nice to help them solve it. They're you know um, removing the stale tag off of the issue to indicate they're still interested. So, but you know again, it's one of these things where. It's hard for us to to take on ourselves, I guess. Yeah, if you want to tag me, I can think of. I'll try to think of um, a reasonable path forward if they want to do this themselves. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, which one did I see the? Oh, the cache. We have this cache type one. Yeah, we have already a Jira card for that one, and it's in the technical debt backlog. So, yeah, it's it's just waiting for us to start working on it. Yeah. So maybe we could, I, I don't know, have some discussion if we it's it's really needed. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should work on it. Yeah, I mean, I think we've gone back and forth on on this one a lot. Um, we're definitely getting some out of memory errors and things. You know, Alex is worked extensively on this. Um, the problem is, is when you switch the cache type to something else, it can, to none, it can create different problems. So it really kind of just depends on what problem you're hitting. If you're, if the, oh, the out of memory is, is bothering you, then you're willing to accept a slow import just so that it can complete. But if, uh, if not, then, you want it to be fast. Now, Alex, are we confident that when we switch to, once we get to C groups V2, when everybody gets there eventually, that this is going to be resolved for everyone? Yeah, um, it's mostly not about C groups V2. It, there's also a companion like Kubernetes uh, follow-up, like an API called memory uh, QoS. Okay. And that is beta, I think, 131, 130. Um, when that's in, then yeah, we're completely protected. But until then, um, the throttling behavior, we're so waiting 
it's it's not in it's not by default we'll still see out of memory instead of throttling mm -hmm. but yeah 130 131 i can't remember how i can find that but yeah to c groups v2 um changes the um it takes the ratio that ratio configurable on the kernel mm -hmm. into account for the individual C group, whereas C groups V1 would just compare it against the total free memory. Mm -hmm. So C groups V2 already brings you to like a pretty good situation by doing that. But yeah. that uh, QoS memory API on the Kubernetes side, that's like the less bit that completely makes you uh, safe from these OMs. Mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> so yeah people will get there eventually but um, i'm monitoring all branches of these uh, issues like for example uh last week somebody hit it with nfs um similar mm -hmm. to how uh, cupert upstream uses nfs csi so I'm I'm still looking into that and I'm still open to, you know, change stuff if we have to. Like uh, there was this idea to um, uh, recreate the importer pod if, if we see uh, an out of memory on the pod conditions. So mm -hmm. that's still an option and that will ba bail us out if, uh, if we ever must go this path. Of course, we would prefer not to. Yeah, it just creates another you know, diverted uh, path in the flow. And then, you know, pe somebody gets this happening to them, you know, just understanding the action that we took and what the, you know, the result of that is can be tricky. Um, you know, I was trying to think if there was a way that we could somehow just um, without changing our code, like somehow cause the, um, uh the network io to be throttled so that i mean it's not the exact right fix but it could be a band-aid until the platform catches up because obviously this is a real platform issue so the question about like us working around it with a complex design that we have to support it you know perpetually um just to fix a plat to work around a platform issue like that's kind of the um the question we're having so in this case i would prefer to have a band-aid that we don't we can stop using immediately when it's no longer needed and i don't know what that could look like It'd be great if there was yeah like some some way to throttle the the io so you wouldn't consume too much page cache or something like that yeah right because we we've seen this um more frequently when uh, people spin up their own lab setups and then they have their own HTTP server. So the import's really quick. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, maybe network throttling can help here. I mean, in that case, yeah, if they're, um, if they're in control of the HTTP server, then uh, the other thing would be is if we if we have them switch to registry imports, do they do we not see it with that? Um, it should be harder with external registry. Like they they probably don't get the same uh, network performance as they get with their own local HTTP server. Well, especially if we ran with the the node pull strategy, because I'm assuming it's not going to unkill the whole node if it's trying to cache the container images. Sorry, which strategy? The the uh, node node pull strategy. Oh. Yeah, um, node pull strategy would always bail you out since you're uh, essentially using the hosts like master C group, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the container runtime pulling on your behalf. Right. So that yeah that that cannot physically own kill because that's using the that's basically the host pulling it. Right. So, I mean, that's unfortunate for people. Then we're saying you have to set up a, a registry. You have to convert your images to container disk. And, you know, it's kind of an, an annoying thing. But, you know, also, yeah. 
it's kind of one of these matters where like we know the platform is fixing this so it's not really our bug it it bothers our users a lot sometimes but it's not our bug All right. Um, any other comments on this? I mean, for me, I'm still wanting to drag my feet as much as I can on, on these kind of changes. Okay. All right. Any other RFEs or things that we should look at? Mm, I don't think so. Most of them are covered. Okay. All right. So I'll bring it back one last time if anybody has. Oh, I see that a new issue got added here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure it's the the right place to discuss it. Uh, it looks like you could be fine. Go ahead. Okay. So basically, we started discussing it uh, last week uh, or two weeks ago. Uh, we're trying to reduce uh, the existing noisy alerts we have in CDI. Discussed most of them. We are left with, with two. One of them is the data in Procron outdated. The issue with this one is that uh, it always fires uh, when you don't have a default storage class set. Yes, the data in Procron uh, import device uh, used the default uh, storage class. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had an argue here, uh, and further remember, Alex said, "Why not keep it? Uh, so uh, users will know that the data in Procon are uh, broken." And uh, other folks like myself said that, uh, "Why uh, fire this alert uh, when you have a um, very basic uh, alerts already fired that you don't have the." storage class default set. Are we already firing? We already have a different alert for no default storage class? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we have both, both of them uh, for every new uh, cluster installed without the default storage class. Mm -hmm. um, I guess uh, we just need to take the decision which which is consistent with other uh, alerts in Kubevirt and uh, CDI. So do we have a similar example where we have a, a root cause alert in a, in... yeah I can't think of a I can't think of a specific uh, other example of this situation um but yeah I feel kind of like if you have I could see both sides of the argument I would tend to lean towards um only reporting about the problem once so if the real problem is no default storage class as long as the alert text or like the run book that that shows up with that alert says that like why it's important to have a default storage class and one of the reasons is, is so that the um that the you know os images can be imported Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I think that's the the right way to go because uh, just bombing the user with uh, several alerts uh, make him confu more confused than uh, uh, go and fix the issue, and we'll we'll uh, immediately complain about it. But uh, uh, but since we hold on, since we have Alex here, like maybe he can. Yeah. Way in again. Yeah. Um, one thing, if if we go this path, is that um, there's this whole section in HCO about uh, putting a costume search class name on, on data import yeah. crons. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, I would have said that's not like a common use case, but there is um, a whole documentation part about it. So, uh, how how would this look like if somebody doesn't want a default storage class? but has um, a specified a costume storage class name on, on the data import crons. I didn't realize we could actually do that. Is that tested? Uh, yeah, it's documented yeah. on the HCL side. Yeah, it's tested. Okay. 
Well, you that's know, a... let, let's split it. Let's not close it as part of this uh, uh, epic. Um, anyway, we want the user to define a default storage class uh, in the, this case. So unless, uh, if it's the, the root cause, why would the user complain about it? Because, you know, if you want to fix it, you fix it. Yeah. And that's it. Uh, um, let's keep it, let's split it from this uh, epic. The other one, the other alert is regarding the local storage class or the no provisioner one where we... Oh, in... sorry, I keep, I, it was taking me a minute to formulate a thought, okay. but regarding okay. the store, the data import cron outdated, okay. it makes me wonder if we actually need two data import cron alerts. So like for me, there's two cases. We can't mm -hmm. start the, in, the data import cron updates because of a configuration problem. That's one. And then secondarily, we can't update because the updates are failing. That could be because the registry is unreachable or because um, there's some other kind of failure with the imports. I think that's going to happen less often. It's almost always a cluster configuration issue. Um, but you could potentially, I don't know if it makes sense to slice and dice that way. Hmm. Um, I, I can tell you that in uh, all the clusters where we had this uh, alert fired, it was a storage class, a different storage class issue. Uh, mm -hmm. um, okay. So if it helps in taking a decision, yeah, I don't know. Um, what was your, so your thought was, um, and I kind of, I think you had taken a decision there and then I came back to revisit it. So what's the plan from your side? Initially, I, I wanted to uh, uh, to suppress this one and not mm -hmm. uh, fire the alert, but Alex uh, has a good uh, rationale to keep it, so. Yeah, okay. It's not, uh, I don't think it's a big deal. Okay, uh, keeping yeah. or leaving it. Uh, All right. We can, keep it, we can keep it as is and wait for, uh, you know, uh, feedback from users about it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. The other one is about uh, the local storage classes where in many clusters, they are uh, they're having a uh, alert fire because they uh, they are not considered known uh, unsupported provisioners. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is there a good reason to uh, fire an, fire an alert about them? Or we should uh, drop this alert. This is a good question. So like for me, I think the original thinking was is if your only storage was like this, uh, it's the only storage that people have access to, they're going to run into the issue. So you want to alert about it. But I think what we're tending to find is in a lot of clusters, you have the local storage class and then you have um, something that uses it um, to provide other storage. So you could make the argument that um, if there's other storage that's known and this is you know one that isn't known, then maybe it's you don't have to alert as much, but, except for maybe if this is the default storage class. Um, mm -hmm. So you could kind of maybe like slice and dice it that way. Like if, if uh, the default storage class is not a known provisioner to CDI, then that's an issue. But mm -hmm. if if a if a there if there is a known default or other known provisioner, and then we also have this storage class around, then it's probably less of an issue. Okay, we we'll get you so... think. Sorry, go ahead. No, so um, we always have the uh, option to. Uh, to label them as known one. But uh, as far as I know, it's an open, it's OpenShift specific label. Right, Alex? 
Yeah, today we just uh, do inferring of these kind of uh, like, you know, like LUNs or like whatever pieces of block storage exposed from the host. Um, we only guess them if they're uh, provisioned by uh, um, local storage operator. So yeah, the other check. ones are unknown. Mm -hmm. Okay. But for example, I, I look at uh, currently at the OpenShift cluster and I see, for example, uh, um, local NVMe disk and the local SSD disks. Both of them are labeled with the uh, OpenShift owner name label. And then we, uh, we are trying to infer from the PVs on the uh, on the cluster the uh, storage profile uh, uh, supported the combinations mm -hmm. so but it uh, but it's a downstream solution it's not uh, i guess we shouldn't use it to uh, promote it uh, upstream mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess the two options here, we either stop alerting about um, like no provisioner um, storage classes, or we start inferring um, for every type of uh, storage class. We do the inferring by looking up PVs, right? I prefer the second option, but uh, because, you know, what can we lose if we infer from the existing PVs? Can it... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I'm starting to also come around that we should just infer. Okay, I'll post the PR with this, with the second option, and we'll discuss okay. it then. There's the, the, the most interesting use case, I think, for this, uh, for, for, you know, doing the inferring is that somebody wants to use CDI to like uh, statically bind like a LUN or something. So mm -hmm. they're going to be specifying, they're going to be using the storage um, API on the data volume, specify, you know, like this clunky storage class name, like local NVMe, like you just said. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and if that story is uh, complete, you know, if we are confident that works, then I think we're, we, we're in a good shape. Mm -hmm. Okay, but by the way, in our own uh, uh, CI, we have the local storage class where we complain, uh, where we fire uh, this alert uh, always, okay? Yep. Yeah, I would say that in, in uh, systems that are working the way we want them to, there shouldn't be alerts mm -hmm. in, as a general rule. Yep. And we have the PVs there. So mm -hmm. there's no good reason to fire this alert. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll post it. Sounds good. All right. Thanks for raising it. And we've kind of gotten to the end of our standard uh, time slot. So, and we're to the end of the agenda. So I will close us out here. Thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Have bye a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.